Hello dear students welcome to our discussion on the topic Indian economy during the period 1950 to 1990 you know after nearly two decades of colonial rule when india got independence in 1947 the economy was in shambles 200 years of british rule had left the economy bleeding it was a big question before our planners as to what kind of economic system would be the most suitable for our economy there were two types of economic systems capitalism and socialism though socialism appealed to pandit nehru who was our first prime minister more than capitalism he did not want it to be the kind of socialism established in the former soviet union where all the resources were owned by the government and all economic planning was done by the government there was no right to private property in such a system it was not possible in a democracy like india for the government to change the ownership pattern of land and other properties of its citizens in the way it was done in the former soviet union therefore our planners sought an alternative to the extreme version of capitalism and socialism basically sympathizing with the socialist outlook they found the system which contained the good features of both the worlds that is the system which combined socialism and capitalism in such a scenario india would be a socialist society with a strong public sector but also with right to private property the government would make plans for the economy with the private sector being encouraged to be part of the plan effort the public sector was expected to take the economy to commanding heights the industrial policy resolution of 1948 and the directive principles of the indian constitution reflected this outlook in 1950 the planning commission was set up with the prime minister as its chairperson the era of five year plans was finally here with this background we will discuss meaning and objectives of planning in india this will be followed by analysis of trends and issues in agriculture and industrial development in the country the first 40 years of planning in india let us discuss this point the story of independent india's economic development process started with adoption of first five year plan in 1951 hence by the end of the year 1990 four decades or 40 years of planning have been completed now let us try to explain what is a plan it is a process where higher authority defines some general goals as well as specific objectives which are to be achieved within a specified period of time in india plans are of 5 years duration and are called 5 year plans our plan documents not only specify the objectives to be attained in the 5 years of a plan but also what is to be achieved over a period of 20 years this long term plan is called perspective plan in five year plans they are supposed to provide the basis for the perspective plan in fact the goals may actually be in conflict because it is tough to give equal importance to all the goals of a plan for example the goal of introducing modern technology may be in conflict with the goal of increasing employment if the technology reduces the need for labor we find different goals being emphasized in different plans in india our five year plans do not spell out how much of each and every good and service is to be produced this is neither possible nor necessary it is enough if the plan is specific 
about the sector where it plays a commanding role. For instance, power generation and irrigation while leaving the rest to the market. Through these five year plans, the government sought to gradually put the economy onto a track of sustained economic development. After gaining independence, the first thing was to reorganize the economy. All the sectors of the economy were in bad shape and for comprehensive development, planning commission started drafting detailed five year plans. As the resources were extremely limited, all the social and economic ambitions could hardly be pursued at the same time. It was necessary for our planners to prioritize the socio-economic goals. Thus, the five-year plans sought to pursue certain specific goals. The four most important goals of these plans were economic growth, modernization, self-reliance, and equity. Let us discuss these goals one by one. First come to the point economic growth. Economic growth means the rate of growth of output of goods and services produced in the country. In simple words, it is the rate of growth of gross domestic product that is GDP over a certain period of time, usually one year. The GDP is the market value of all the goods and services produced in the country during the year. You can think of the GDP as a cake. Growth is increase in the size of that cake. If the cake is larger, more people can enjoy it. It is necessary to produce more goods and services if the people of India are to enjoy a richer and more varied life. A higher rate of growth implies either a larger stock of productive capital or a large size of supporting services like transport, banking or an increase in the efficiency of productive capital and services. The GDP of a country is derived from different sectors of the economy, namely the agricultural sector the industrial sector and the service sector. The contribution made by each of these sectors make up the structural composition of the economy. In developing countries, growth in agriculture contributes more to the GDP growth, while in developed countries, the growth in the service sector contributes more to the GDP growth. Come to the point modernization. Modernization is transition from traditional rural agrarian society to modern urban and industrial society. Producers, manufacturers have to adopt new technology to increase the production of goods and services. For example, a farmer can increase the output on the farm by using new production techniques, seed varieties instead of using the old ones. Similarly, a factory owner can increase output by using a new type of machine. Adoption of new technology is called modernization. However, modernization does not only refer to the use of new and modern technology, but also to changes in social outlook such as the recognition that women should have the same rights as men. In a traditional society, women are supposed to remain at home while men work. A modern society makes use of the talents of women in every field, in banks, factories, schools, etc. And they are given a chance to sign like man and such a society will be more civilized and prosperous than the pre-modern society. Let us talk about self-reliance. Self-reliance means using nation's own resources 
and avoiding resources imported from other countries to promote economic growth of the nation. The first seven five-year plans gave importance to self-reliance which means avoiding import of goods that can be produced in India. This policy was considered a necessity in order to reduce our dependence on foreign countries. Further, it was feared that dependence on imported food supplies, foreign technology and foreign capital may make India's sovereignty vulnerable to foreign interference in our policies. Let us come now to the point equity. All the other three factors may not improve the kind of life which people are living. It is important to ensure that the benefits of economic prosperity reach the poor sections as well as instead of being enjoyed only by the rich. So, in addition to growth, modernization and self-reliance, equity is also important. It means equal distribution of income and wealth among all the people of the society. Every Indian should be able to meet his or her basic needs such as food, shelter, education and health care in order to reduce inequality. Apart from the above mentioned major goals, there were other goals like development of human resources, poverty alleviation, reduction in inequality of income and environment protection. Now, let us now discuss the sectoral aspects during the planning period. So, let us first take up development of agricultural sector. There was neither growth nor equity in the agricultural sector during the colonial rule. The policy makers solved these issues by implementing land reform measures on one side and adopting new agricultural strategy on the other. Land reforms which includes abolition of intermediaries and selling on land holdings among others have been aimed at improving and uplifting the general living condition of rural households. On the other hand, new agricultural strategy was aimed at improving productivity through use of better inputs, the result of which has been known as green revolution. Let us explain these two points one by one. The land tenure system in India was characterized by intermediaries known as Jamindars, Jagirdars, etc., who merely collected rent from the actual tillers of the soil without contributing towards improvement on the farm. The low productivity of the agricultural sector forced India to import food from other countries. Land reforms were initiated to bring equity in agriculture which refers to change in the ownership of land holdings. Steps were taken to abolish intermediaries and to make the tillers the owners of the land. This move would give incentives to the tillers to invest in making improvements provided sufficient capital was made available to them. Coming to land ceiling, it was intended to promote equity in the agricultural sector. This means fixing the maximum size of land which could be owned by an individual. The motive behind this was to reduce the concentration of land ownership in a few hands. The ownership gave tenants the incentive to increase output and this contributed to growth in agriculture. However, the goal of equity was not fully served by abolition of intermediaries. In some areas, the former Jamindars continued to own large areas of land by making use of some loopholes in the legislation. 
there were cases where tenants were evicted and the landowners claimed to be self cultivators the actual tillers claiming ownership of the land and even when the tillers got ownership of land the poorest of the agricultural laborers such as sharecroppers and landless laborers did not benefit from land reforms the land ceiling legislation also faced many hurdles the big landlords challenged the legislation in courts delaying its implementation they used this delay to register their lands in the name of close relatives thereby escaping from the legislation the legislation also had a lot of loopholes which were exploited by the big landlords to retain their land the only two states where land reforms were very successful were kerala and west bengal because these states had governments committed to the policy of land to the tiller now come to the phenomena called green revolution about 75% of the country's population was dependent on agriculture before independence the use of traditional technology and the absence of required infrastructure for majority of farmers resulted in low productivity of agriculture very few farmers had access to irrigation and if monsoon fell short the farmers were in trouble indian agriculture was famously known as a gamble of monsoons the stagnation in agriculture during the colonial rule was permanently broken by the green revolution the term green revolution referred to the large increase in production of food grains resulting from the use of high yielding variety that is hyv seeds especially for wheat and rice use of better technology and mechanization of farming raising the awareness levels of farmers etc the use of these seeds required the use of fertilizers pesticides irrigation facilities to increase productivity of agriculture the farmers who could benefit from hyv seeds required financial resources to purchase inputs as a result in the first phase of the green revolution approximately in the mid 60s up to mid 70s the use of hyv seeds were restricted to wealthy states such as punjab andhra pradesh and tamil nadu in the second phase of green revolution between mid 1970s to mid 1980s the hyv technology expanded to larger number of states and benefited more variety of crops the spread of green revolution technology enabled india to achieve self sufficiency in food grains growth in agricultural output is important but it is not enough the higher output will not make much of a difference to the economy if a large proportion of this increase in consumed by the farmers themselves instead of being sold in the market if on the other hand a significant amount of agricultural produce is sold in the market by the farmers the larger output can make difference to the economy the portion of agricultural produce which is sold in the market by the farmers is called marketed surplus opportunely as pointed out by the famous economist c h hanumanta rao a good proportion of the rice and wheat produced during the green revolution period was sold by the farmers in the market as a result the price of food grains declined relative to other items of consumption the low income groups who used to spend a large percentage of their income on food benefited from this decline in relative prices the green revolution enabled the government to procure sufficient amount of food grains to build a buffer stock which could be used in times of 
food shortage. Now come to development of industry and trade. Economists have found that poor nations can progress only if they have a good industrial sector. Employment is more secure in industrial sector as compared to the agricultural sector. Industrial sector promotes modernization and overall prosperity. It is for this reason that the five-year plans place a lot of emphasis on industrial development. At the time of independence, the variety of industries was very narrow, largely confined to cotton, textiles and jute. There were only two well-managed iron and steel firms, one in Jamshedpur and the other in Calcutta, now Kolkata. But we needed to enlarge the industrial base in the country with a variety of industries if the economy was to grow. Let us discuss the industrial policy resolution of 1956. In accordance with the goal of the state controlling commanding heights of the economy, the industrial policy resolution of 1956 was adopted. This resolution formed the basis of the second five-year plan, the plan which tried to build the basis for a socialist pattern of society. This resolution classified industries into three categories. The first category comprised of industries which would be exclusively owned by the state. The second category consisted of industries in which the private sector could supplement the efforts of the state sector with the state taking the sole responsibility for starting new units. The third category consisted of the remaining industries which were to be in the private sector. Although there was a category of industries left to the private sector, the sector was kept under state control through a system of licenses. No new industry was allowed unless a license was obtained from the government. This policy was used for promoting industry in backward regions. It was easier to obtain a license if the industrial unit was established in an economically backward area. In addition, such units were given certain concessions such as tax benefits and electricity at a lower tariff. The purpose of this policy was to promote regional equality. Even an existing industry had to obtain a license for expanding output or for diversifying production that is producing a newly variety of goods. This was meant to ensure that the quantity of goods produced was not more than what the economy required. License to expand production was given only if the government was convinced that the economy required the larger quantity of goods. Now come to the point small scale industry. In 1955, the Village and Small Scale Industries Committee, also called the Carve Committee, noted the possibility of using small scale industries for encouraging rural development. A small scale industry is defined with reference to maximum investment allowed on the assets of a unit. This limit has changed over a period of time. In 1950, a small scale industrial unit was one which invested a maximum of rupees 5 lakh. Today, the maximum investment allowed is rupees 1 crore. It was assumed that small scale industries are more labor intensive, that is, they use more labor than the large scale industries and therefore generate more employment. It is evident that growth of small scale industry requires them to be protected from the large farms. To fulfill this motive, the production of a number of products was reserved for small scale industry. The criteria of reservation being 
the ability of these units to manufacture the goods. These industries were also given some incentives to flourish such as lower excise duty and bank loans at lower interest rates. Now come to discuss the point trade policy which is also known as import substitution policy. In the initial stages of development, the country had just got obtained freedom after about 200 years of colonial rule, which had started with trade relation with the East India Company. Therefore, it was natural for our planners to have a skeptical attitude towards foreign trade. The trade policy adopted in the initial plans was inward looking one, which discouraged foreign trade, particularly imports. This inward looking trade policy is technically called import substitution policy in which imports are replaced by domestic production of goods. For example, instead of importing vehicles made in a foreign country, industries would be encouraged to produce them in India itself. Another major features of India's foreign trade policy was protection to domestic industries. In this policy, the government protected the domestic industries from foreign competition. Protection from imports took two forms, tariffs and quotas. Tariffs are a tax on imported goods. They make imported goods more expensive and discourage their use. Quotas specify the quantity of goods which can be imported. The effect of tariffs and quotas is that they restrict imports and therefore protect the domestic firms from foreign competition. The policy of protection is based on the notion that domestic industry in India was still in its infancy and needed to be protected from foreign competition. It was believed that if domestic industries are left on their own to compete against the technologically superior foreign firms, they would die a premature death. On the other hand, it is assumed that if the domestic industries are protected, they would learn to compete in course of time. It was necessary to give domestic players a level playing field. Our planners also feared the possibility of foreign exchange being spent on import of luxury goods if no restrictions were placed on imports. The counterpart of import substitution strategy was export promotion policy which was neglected until the mid 1980s. Let us now see the development of industries during the five year plans under this head five year plans and industrial development. The achievements of India's industrial sector during the first seven plans are impressive indeed. The proportion of GDP contributed by the industrial sector, the rise in the industry's share of GDP is an important indicator of development and reflects a positive change in the sectoral composition of the GDP of India. No longer is the Indian industry restricted largely to cotton textiles and jute. In fact, the industrial sector has become well diversified. Some credit for the development of the industrial sector also goes to the public sector. The promotion of small scale industries gave opportunities to those people who did not have the capital to start large firms to get into business. Protection from foreign competition enabled the development of indigenous industries in the areas of electronics and automobile sectors which otherwise could not have developed. We have mentioned that some credit for the industrial development of the country also goes to the public sector. However, many economists are critical of the performance of the public sector. In the 1950s, the public sector was expected to take the economy to commanding heights. It was also felt 
that the private sector at that time did not possess adequate capital and technology. Therefore, it was necessary for the public sector to complement the private sector to accelerate the rate of industrial development. It is now widely held that state enterprises continue to produce certain goods and services even when they were no longer required to be produced by the public sector. An example is the provision of telecommunication services. This industry continued to be reserved for the public sector even after it was realized that private sector firms could also provide it. Due to the absence of competition, even till the late 90s, one had to wait for a long time to get a telephone connection. Similarly, the production of simple things like bread or running of hotels and restaurants not requiring much capital and state of the art technology by the public sector could hardly be justified. This has led some scholars to argue that the state should get out of areas which the private sector can manage and the government may concentrate its resources on important services which the private sector cannot provide. Moreover, many public sector enterprises were marked by problems like corruption, overstaffing, red tapism and lack of accountability and therefore overall inefficiency. This led to creation of SIC units increasing the burden on the resources of the economy. License quota permit Raj encumbered the economy and thereby killed competition and efficiency. This also encouraged red tapism. Lot of time of investors was wasted in obtaining licenses and permissions etc. rather than utilizing it on productive activities. Protection of the industries which was started in the 1950s on the grounds of infancy of the Indian industry was meant for a few years but was carried for too long and made the industrial players complacent with the existing level of costs with no urge to become more efficient. Competition from imports forces our producers to be more efficient. Thus, it was believed that protection at this juncture of time was doing more harm than good. A few economists also point out that the public sector is not meant for earning profits but to promote the welfare of the nation. The public sector firms on this view should be evaluated on the basis of the extent to which they contribute to the welfare of people and not to the profits they earn. Regarding protection, some economists hold that even the developed countries protect their industries against foreign competition. So, in order to provide a level play field to our domestic producers, we should also do the same. In view of the same, new era of liberalization, privatization and globalization was started with the economic reforms launched in the year 1991. Now, let us conclude and summarize. The period 1950 to 1990 was undoubtedly a commendable success particularly when compared to the period before 1950. The economy which registered less than 1 percent annual rate of growth during the first half century broke the barrier of Hindu rate of growth which is a very low rate of growth the Indian economy grew at 3.5 percent per annum during 1950 to 80 towards the 1980s. Our industries became far more diversified compared to the situation which was prevalent during independence. India became self-sufficient in food production thanks to the Green Revolution. Land reforms resulted in abolition of Jamindari system. However, the role played by the public sector enterprises was debatable. Excessive government regulation 
prevented growth of entrepreneurship. The inward looking import substitution policy, which is again debatable, particularly after the success stories registered by the four Asian tigers that were South Korea, Singapore, Taiwan and Hong Kong. Most of these concerns were taken care of when economic reforms of 1991 were launched after this period. Thank you.